I expected something like this from Cohen. He's been lying all week. I mean, or, or for two, he's been lying for years. And I don't see how he has any credibility. I mean, this is basically if you had a trial, and there won't be a trial here, but if you had a trial, you'd say, well, which lie do you want to pick? You want to pick the first lie, the second lie, or maybe some new lie? There's nobody that I know that knows him that hasn't warned me that if he's back is up against the wall, he'll, he'll lie like crazy because he's lied all his life. The man is a liar, a proven liar. There's no way. You're going to bring down the president of the United States on the testimony uncorroborated of a proven liar. And I, I guarantee I you, this guy is a proven liar. So Heilman has joined the table. I saw that last night. I yes. missed the beginning. And I thought he was talking about Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah. The great thing about it is that he's saying, first of all, he's saying. And I was flabbergasted. I'm like, did he get we fired? Can't, we can't take the testimony of a proven liar who was the personal lawyer of proven, proven liar. liar because, <laughs> well, uh, how would you possibly know what to do? Um, I will say somebody made the point this morning. Uh, I believe it was Joint's fans who said that when you're prosecuting a case, you get to pick your witnesses. You, your witnesses are chosen by the defendant. The defendant chooses who to commit crimes with. Often they choose liars to commit crimes with. And so you get witnesses who are liars. The question what you do in a court is you demonstrate why certain people who are proven liars are believable in this instance because of the accumulation of evidence and others who are proven liars are should not be believed because of another accumulation of evidence. But the fact that anyone, the president or Michael Cohen or anybody else has a history of lying is not relevant to whether what they are saying in any given instance is true and what the, the totality of the evidence shows in that case. I guess, and the point is, we're so conditioned to um, cover their lies, to talk about everything they say as lies, but now we're talking about a, a, a legal setting where, where right. they have serious serious implications. It's, All of right. course, just funny to hear Rudy talking about, you, like, I missed a tirade about, about liars. I oh, the liar. I rounded three times. Can't tolerate the lying. Yeah, oh, yeah, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Client, All right, so buddy. that was the discredit Cohen strategy. It was on full display in the aftermath of reports that Michael Cohen is willing to offer potentially damning information on Trump to Robert Mueller, just after Cohen's lawyer released a recording of a conversation with Trump about hush money. It's become an all-out war between Trump and his former fixer that at least according to the Daily Beast, has left their relationship shattered beyond repair. The Daily Beast reporting, quote, two sources who have spoken to Trump about Cohen this week said the president was furious, hurling expletives per one confidant after CNN revealed Cohen had covertly recorded at least one of their conversations. They're dead to each other now, said another source close to the president who also knows Cohen. Trump allies are already gaming out how to, in the words of one outside advisor, Barry Cohen. Joining us now, former U.S. attorney Barbara McQuaid, Betsy Woodruff, politics reporter for the Daily Beast, and as I mentioned, Hal Lynn has joined the table. Barbara, let me ask you a question. Um, there's also reporting that Michael Cohen puts other people in the room with Donald Trump Jr. and the president. Could that be the piece that explains why he was willing to dangle this out there? Could that be something that's of interest or of value if he can paint a picture and, and offer up the names of other witnesses that could say that, yeah, Donald Trump knew about this meeting? Yes, very much so. In fact, if you listen to Rudy Giuliani when he's using the word lie, lie, lie over and over again, one of the things he says that's really important is uncorroborated. Um, the key that a prosecutor would want to do in a case with a witness like Michael Cohen is to corroborate him. And one way you can do it is by not calling him at all, but calling these other people. He can provide the information that uh, person A, B, and C were also in the room when this happened. And so it could be that that's very helpful information, but that Robert Mueller ends up calling as a witness person A, B, or C. In addition, there can be all kinds of other corroboration. There could be uh, maybe he recorded the conversation as he's done on other occasions. Maybe there are text messages referring to the conversation or email messages. So there are a lot of ways you can corroborate it. You wouldn't have that statement standing all alone be all that you rely on. You would use all these other ways to support it. And Betsy Woodruff, that's why their destroy Michael Cohen plan may come up well short of erasing him as, as, as the X factor here. He may know enough about other people who saw and witnessed what went on and what, what went down in Trump Tower. That's right. If you don't have to rely on Michael Cohen, you probably won't want to. And if, assuming that the reporting is correct, which I haven't confirmed, but assuming it's correct, that there were additional people in the room when Trump was alerted to the fact that this meeting was going to happen, that obviously would play a key role in potentially corroborating anything Michael Cohen said. One thing I can tell you is that the, the uh, attacks or the efforts to undermine Cohen are likely to come from people outside the White House. Don't anticipate people currently working in the White House going after him. 
it would put them in a very weird situation to try to attack the credibility of someone who up until quite recently worked for their boss, the president. However, people in Rudy Giuliani's circle, additional outside surrogates, outside allies, you can expect to see those people in the coming weeks and months do everything uh, in their power to try to just torch Michael Cohen's credibility. Torching Michael Cohen's credibility is key to defending the president here. You know, Barbara, um, you know, Barbara McQuaid talked about persons A, B, and C. I'd right. like to just suggest the possibility on the basis not of any assertion that this is true, but on the basis of just knowing the way that campaign right. operated. What was right. the world like in June of 2016? I'd like to suggest person H, in specific person HH, Hope Hicks. Uh, if you were looking for likely people who would likely have been in almost any room Donald Trump was in when you were talking about meetings that might be happening in that building in June of 2016, Hope Hicks would be at the top of that list, and she has already talked to Robert Mueller. Do you know if um, Hope Hicks is one of the people Michael Cohen can put I, in that room? I do not know, but I yeah. do know how closely Michael Cohen and Hope Hicks and everyone in that very small mom and right. shop office, that, uh, mom and pop shop office that is Trump Tower. You just dropped a story, and I want to get to it, but this is a really important point. People around the president, and this is why we started the show by saying what we heard with our own ears is really important. Donald Trump wasn't walled off from the gross aspects of covering up his sexual relationships or, or being involved in getting dirt. That was where he thrived. And he he wasn't some titan of business. He ran a very small mom and pop operation, and Michael Cohen was his right hand man. People often think of the Trump Organization because President Trump is a very good brander as this big Fortune 500 like company. It is tiny, and it's basically his home office. He right. lives in that building. Right. His children grew up in that building. It's a very, very small operation where people have worked there for dozens of years. People don't leave, new people don't really come in. Right. And so, not only does everyone there know what's going on and know all the players and everyone's interconnected, but as, as people who are close to the president have always said to me, nothing happens in that organization without the president knowing about it. And, and, he took a, and he always took a very intense interest in negative information about Hillary Clinton. And Matt so, Miller, and I want to get you in on this, and then I want to get to Emily's piece. You're, you're, uh, all that information, obviously um, known to Robert Mueller, the Southern District of New York, it seems like there's a lot that they know that we don't know at this point. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And if you think about the, the two big investigations going on here, the Mueller investigation and the Southern District of New York investigation, Michael Cohen is the piece that fuses those two investigations together. Obviously, we know he comes up in the, you know, he's now put himself in the middle of the Mueller investigation with this piece of information that leaked out last night. There, he also comes up prominently in the dossier. There was a report by mm. McClatchy several months ago that, that reports that he actually was in Prague, as the dossier said, despite his denials. That report hasn't been confirmed by any other news outlets, so I think we're waiting to see whether that's true mm -hmm. or not. Um, he denied it, but he now seems to be changing his story. He obviously is the target of the SDNY investigation, which we now know is pulling in the Trump Organization because SDNY has subpoenaed the CFO of the Trump Organization. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these two massive threats to the president, Michael Cohen is right at the center of both of them. And if he does decide that his only path forward, his only way out of this jeopardy, because he's not going to get a pardon anymore, that seems clear, is to talk about both what he knows about Russia and what he knows about Trump's business dealings before the campaign ever began. It is a nor an enormous, enormous threat to the president. Emily, let's put up the headline for your new piece. Just dropped a couple of minutes ago after you were on the air. We love that. We love people who file in the 4 o'clock hour. Fury, Michael Cohen is mad as hell, and he's not going to take it anymore. And, and this jumped out at me. Uh, Cohen has reached out to another Trump foe. According to two people with knowledge of the situation, on Friday morning, Cohen texted Steve Bannon. That's this morning. Mm -hmm. The former White House chief strategist, who was forcibly ejected from the White House after making a series of inflammatory remarks about the president and his family to Michael Wolf in his book Fire and Fury. In one claim, Bannon told Wolf that Trump knew about the Trump Tower meeting with Don Jr. and the Russian lawyer. The chance that Don Jr. did not walk these Jumos up to his father's office on the Jumos, 26th. Jumos, I believe is the word. What is that? I, I'm going to have to Google that after. I forgot. <laughs> I've read this before. I forgot what it meant. The fact that he did not walk them up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero. Bannon told Wolf, calling the meeting treasonous and unpatriotic. That was the claim that, among other things, um, got Bannon thrown out of his uh, cushy West Wing perch. Um, talk about the fact that Cohen and Bannon now corroborate one another's version of Donald Trump's knowledge of the meeting. 
Timing is everything, right? So <laughs> their, their stories now align. These are two people who didn't necessarily work together and didn't necessarily see eye to eye during the campaign. Mm -hmm. But this morning, of all mornings after the news broke, Michael Cohen is, is living in a hotel where Steve Bannon stays when he comes to New York. Mm -hmm. and, and Michael Cohen had run into people who work with Steve Bannon. And so Michael Cohen fired off a text and said, hey, I've seen all your people around. Are you still at the Regency? And Steve Bannon responded basically saying, you know, nice to hear from your brother, but I think we should only communicate lawyer, lawyer to lawyer from now on. But once this all blows over, we should catch up. And let's just and let's just be clear about one thing about this. I think Steve Bannon's testimony here is, is is valuable in the sense that he understands that Donald Trump operates. He understands the inner workings of that organization. He was not present in June of 2016. Right. He was not in that room. He was not working on the campaign yet. It was still two months before he would join. So he's speculating about what he or makes the assertion. Told him. Or I someone mean, told him. Or someone told him. But he's, he could never around. be a direct evidentiary witness in this right. case because he was not present at that time. However, like I said, he knew how the operation worked. He knows what the relationship between Don Trump, Donald Trump Jr. is and his father. He knows what kinds of things the son would tell the father, what kinds of things the father would want to know. He has, it's very informed, <laughs> highly informed speculation. Barbara McQuaid, how does an investigator look at that, take into account that they have similar, and uh, the, the analysis is the same. Michael Cohen, though, as, as an eyewitness who was saying that he was in the room when, when Don Jr. told the president. Steve Bannon, though, heard from somebody, um, and Heilman named one name of, of where he could have heard it. Um, this was a small organization. I imagine it would be a methodical process to find out what everyone's version of events were in terms of Donald Trump's knowledge of this meeting. It, absolutely. So you would ask Michael Cohen who else was present, and you'd want to talk to each of those people about what their recollection was, what they heard, what they saw. And you'd also want to talk to Steve Bannon. You say, you speculate that, um, that this occurred. Um, tell us how you know that. Have you heard this from anybody? Have you seen reference to it? Have you seen any documents about it? What makes you say that? And so from that, you can obtain other evidence. In fact, it could even be possible that you can cut Michael Cohen right out of this as a witness and put on someone else who was present who has good credibility to testify that they were present when this happened um, without casting any doubt at all on it. So that's the way it goes. And that's why investigations can take so long. And it's difficult to predict when they'll end, because every time you talk to someone, Someone and you find out about some meeting that happened, you want to ask who else was there, who else knows about it, and then you need to talk to all of those people. And so the investigations can move on exponentially in that way um, to, to track down every important detail. Um, let me give you the last word, Betsy Woodruff, and just ask you about Steve Bannon, because the reaction to Steve Bannon's comments in Fire and Fury and the reaction to the raid on Michael Cohen's offices from the president were identical. And it, and it, it should be noted, there, had, there has been nothing that has happened to the country that he leads that has made the president as upset or angry publicly as the attack on his personal lawyer and fixer's office and as the criticisms from his former political Spengali, Steve Bannon. That's right. The thing that Trump cares about more than anything else is loyalty, whether or not he's actually earned that loyalty from the people around him. And when he sees the people around him betray him or somehow show vulnerabilities to those who are potentially targeting the president, he doesn't respond particularly well. Another piece of detail here that's important to remember is that once Trump has cast people out of his circle into the outer dark, he stops talking about them. He stops using their <laughs> names. Besides maybe one or two tweets, the president essentially never mentions Steve Bannon. In recent weeks, despite the fact that Michael Cohen has dominated headlines, Trump isn't tweeting his name. He doesn't want to give either of these men any sort of notoriety, any sort of uh, hooks they could use to try to publicize themselves or their efforts. He doesn't want to in any way dignify, if you will, the comments that they've made and the trouble that they've caused for him. So that's a really strong indicator that both of these men are just dead to the president. Dead and dangerous. They're all witnesses. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.